This is David Diga Hernandez, and you're watching Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. What does the Bible say about angelic beings? We're going to be exploring these exciting revelations, but first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me. He's going to lead you in some very anointed worship, and then we're getting right into this message. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and heal your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and heal your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. You are the Lord, my healer. You are the Lord, my healer. So as with every other topic, we're going to approach this topic from the Word of God. The Word of God needs to be the foundation of our understanding for anything spiritual. And it's important that we not venture out too far into areas that the Scripture has not described for us in detail. It's very, very dangerous when you leave the sure Word of God to go and explore ideas of your own. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking questions about the supernatural. I believe in angels. I believe in demons. I believe in heaven and hell. You and I both believe in the supernatural, and the Bible teaches all of those things are real. But it's important that we not become carried away with topics that are not to be our primary focus. Jesus must remain our focus. The Word of God must remain our foundation. So as we explore the Word of God concerning angelic beings, I need you to remember that we have to always come back to the Word. There are many wonderful revelations that the body of Christ has received concerning angelic beings. But there are also sometimes that people will throw out ideas that are a little strange, and strange is not necessarily always bad, but they'll throw out ideas that are strange and then not backed by Scripture. So while it's exciting to explore these topics, we must remain grounded in the Word. So as I go through these truths concerning angelic beings, I want you to remember that not everything concerning the angelic realm is perfectly crystal clear as far as how it's laid out in Scripture. The Bible gives us glimpses into the angelic realm. The Bible gives us ideas about the angelic realm. 
So, for example, in just a moment, I'm going to show you the different classes of angelic beings in the scripture. Now, as far as exactly how these angels are ranked, or if this really is the full list of all the angelic types, we don't really know that for certain. All we can do is take what we know with certainty to be the word of God and take what that tells us and then build our belief upon that. So we shouldn't venture too far out away from that. It's okay to speculate sometimes. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to suggest to suggest interesting ideas, but we mustn't build ideas off of this foundation. So as we explore this, remember to keep that in mind. Now, there's a lot of debate about the classes of angels, their ranks, and so forth. But as far as what I see in Scripture, these are probably the clearest that I can see as far as types of angels. Now, some would categorize these differently than I have, and that's okay. As I said, the Bible has given us glimpses into the angelic realm. So for me to be dogmatic about something that's only been somewhat covered in the Scripture would be uh, unhealthy. It wouldn't be a good idea. So let's take a look first here. The first type of angel that I want to look at, and this, as far as I can tell in the scripture, appears to be the highest ranking angel that there is. Now, again, we don't know that perhaps there are other types of ranks or that perhaps there are other types of angelic beings that are not necessarily listed in scripture. It's not as if God owes it to us to explain all of the workings in the heavenly realm. He simply gives us understanding in the areas that we need understanding. He gives us revelation for those things that apply to us and that actually affect our lives. So first and foremost, we have the archangels. Now, this word archangels actually in the original language means chief angels. In Jude chapter 1 verse 9, the Bible says, but even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. Now, in some translations of the Bible, that right there, that mightiest of the angels would have been translated archangel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. So there again, we see another mention of an archangel. Now, archangels are stronger. Archangels are more powerful. They, one of their tasks is to engage in spiritual warfare. And the reason we can see that archangels are more powerful is because what we see in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, where the Bible says, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. That's an angelic being talking. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So Michael came and somewhat rescued this other angelic being from the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which was a spiritual being, a demonic force or a stronghold, as you would say. Next, we see the seraphim. Now, the seraphim are found in Isaiah chapter 6, which is a text I often reference. And it's one of my favorite portions of scripture, as you can probably tell if you've listened to my teachings for any length of time. But Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse number 1, let's read it again here. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. So, I suspect here, and in fact, some Bible scholars also suspect that the seraphim were singing, holy, holy, holy. So these seraphim have the ability to sing, some believe. And here you can see they are tasked with the worship of God. Seraphim are worshipers. Verse 4 tells us very clearly that their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. Now, that is a powerful voice. If as they're singing, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies, the foundations of the temple are shaking, that tells us that these angelic beings have booming voices. I can't even imagine what worship will be like when we finally cross over into the heavenly realm. Now think about this. I, I get annoyed sometimes when I'm at a, a red light and somebody pulls up next to me, you know, they have the bass 
um, going off in their car, and you can, you can feel the bass in your body from the car next to you. That's because of the sound waves. It's such a powerful force that you can feel it in your body. Can you imagine an army of seraphim, or however many there are, we don't really know, there, there are some here that we were told about, and then we know the scripture doesn't necessarily give us a count of how many angelic beings exist. We don't know. But imagine an army of seraphim, each one with such a booming and powerful voice that they can shake a building in its foundation, a choir of them singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. I'll bet you could feel that in your core when you're in the heavenly realm. So the seraphim have these booming voices. They worship. They have powerful, strong voices. Verse 5 says, Then I said, It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. He was terrified. Isaiah was terrified because here they are singing the holiness of God and the building is shaking. He's just terrified because he knew he was a sinful man. It's all over. I'm doomed, for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Now watch this, verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed, and your sins are forgiven. So we see that the seraphim also play a role in the spiritual realm, in some way, somehow, they play a role in the purification of believers. Here Isaiah is a prophet. He's obviously a servant of God. These seraphim come. They're worshiping God. Isaiah is terrified, not necessarily because he's sinful as we would count him sinful by human standards, but everyone compared to the holiness of God is sinful. So Isaiah catches this glimpse of the heavenly realm and because of the marvelous light of the glory of God, he's able now to see all of his own flaws. And the seraphim goes and cleanses him. So the seraphim are charged with worship and with purification. So that's archangels, seraphim. And again, we don't know that they necessarily go in this order. I suspect, as I said, that archangels are the mightiest of the angels, as we're told in Jude chapter 1, verse 9, or that they, 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 have, they are the chief angels. So I think it's safe to say that archangels are on the top, and as far as what's revealed to us. Next, we see the cherubim. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 says, After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 1, we see that these cherubim are described in detail. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5, and then verses 13 through 15 say this, From the center of the cloud came four living beings that looked human. The living beings looked like bright coals of fire or brilliant torches, and lightning seemed to flash back and forth among them. And the living beings darted to and fro like flashes of lightning. As I looked at these beings, I saw four wheels touching the ground beside them, one wheel belonging to each. Now that phrase, one wheel belonging to each, is key because it helps us to see the identity of these four living beings. So Ezekiel 1, 5 and 13 through 15 describes these living beings. And then Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, reveals the identity of these living beings. Again, remember that phrase, one will belonging to each. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, In my vision I saw what appeared to be a throne of blue lapis lazuli above the crystal surface over the heads of the cherubim. Then the Lord spoke to the man in linen clothing and said, Go between the whirling wheels beneath the cherubim and take a handful of burning coals and scatter them over the city. He did this as I watched. So there are several things we see about the cherubim. Of course, we see in Genesis that they were guarding the way to the tree of life. And then, of course, also in the book of Exodus, we see that the cherubim's images were placed in the tabernacle. And then, of course, we see here in Ezekiel that they're described as these living beings that move back and forth. And they were there at the vision of Ezekiel. They were there when Ezekiel was being given a message by God. So they accompany the presence of God. And there are many other verses in the Bible that tell us about the cherubim. But overall, I think all angelic beings sort of serve similar purposes, but with different areas of focuses much like you and I. All of us can evangelize. All of us can hear from God and repeat God. All of us should know the word and be able to teach the word. But then even though we're all able to do 
these general tasks, each of us have been given a specific gift and a specific function and a specific focus. So I would say that all angelic beings could probably participate in worship or in cleansing or giving messages. Maybe not all of them participate in spiritual warfare, but it seems to me as we continue to read scripture about angels that they all have similar tasks but with special areas of focus. Now, after the cherubim are just what you would call common angels. And when I say common angels, I'm by no means trying to disrespect angelic beings or try to belittle them. I just mean common in that they're part of kind of just the infantry, the, the regular angel, if you will. So archangels, the seraphim, the cherubim, then there are angels. Now, after that, we see that there are fallen angels. Now, when it comes to fallen angels, you have to remember this. There were actually two sins that were committed by these angelic beings. So, there are two punishments. When the angelic beings first rebelled against God, their first punishment was that they were cast down to the earth. In fact, we see this in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9, where the Bible says, This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all of his angels. So here is the first rebellion. Here is the first sin committed by these angelic beings. They rebelled against God. They participated in this celestial mutiny. And God punishes them by casting them to the earth with the devil. Now, there is more that I cover on this. I have a lesson on the origins of demons, and this will help to kind of put together the timeline. But for now, I want to focus on just the simpler thoughts concerning fallen angels. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 tells us that they were punished by being sent to the earth. This was in their rebellion against God. They're punished by being sent to the earth. Genesis chapter 6, Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God, that's the angelic beings, saw the beautiful women, and they took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Now, of course, if you are going to look and say, well, the sons of God were probably just human beings who weren't supposed to procreate with certain people outside of, you know, national borders, so to speak. Well, this was before the implementation of those laws of nations. And why would that then cause giants to be born if it was just human being with human being? No, these are angelic beings. In fact, in the Old Testament, whenever you see the reference sons of God, you never see that as a reference to a human being. You will always see it as a reference to a supernatural being. So you have the first sin committed by some of these angels where they rebel against God. They're punished by being sent to the earth. And then these angels who had fallen now are on the earth. They commit a second sin. And then we see their punishment, which is found in 2 Peter chapter 2, Verse number four. So 2 Peter 2, 4 says this. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And then Revelation chapter 9, verse 11 also talks about, of course, the king of the bottomless pit. Now, I suspect that some of the angels who participated in that original first sin, the mutiny, who were cast down to the earth, I suspect not all of them, or I should say, I suspect some of them did not participate in that second sin, namely intercourse with human beings. I believe that because in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, we are given a warning to not believe another gospel even if an angelic being preaches it to us. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 says, Let God's curse fall on anyone including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preached to you. So we're being given a warning about angelic beings preaching a different gospel. So I think it's possible that not all of the angels participated in this second sin. Of course, all of the fallen angels participated in the first sin. That's why they're fallen angels. So it's possible that there are some fallen angels walking among us today 
And just a little hint for you here, demons are not fallen angels. Fallen angels and demonic beings are two totally separate beings. And again, for more on that, you can go check out my teaching titled The Origins of Demons. So now that we've taken a look at the classes of angels, or the categories of angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim, common angels, fallen angels, I want to now look at just a few simple truths regarding angelic beings. Number one, angels have physical bodies. Luke chapter 24, verse 4 says, As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. So they called them men. But here in verse 23, we actually see the truth. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. There were some references in the Old Testament about angelic beings who had come to visit men of God. And the people wanted to have sexual intercourse with those angelic beings. In fact, we just read it in Genesis chapter 6 that many of these angels actually had intercourse with human beings. So they have a physical body. I'm aware of the verse that says that angels are neither married nor given in marriage, but this is speaking nothing about their actual physical attributes. It's just the reality that they don't participate in the covenant of marriage. But still, we know that angels have physical bodies. Now, it appears to me, after looking through Scripture, that their physical bodies are not exactly like ours. They can, I believe, become invisible because many times in the Scripture they appear, then they disappear. So they have physical bodies, but with capabilities far beyond that of our bodies. So angels have physical bodies. Number two, angels can appear in dreams. Think about that, that angels can actually go into someone's dream. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So angelic beings can visit believers in their dreams, and possibly even unbelievers. Next, we see that angels actually walk among us. So though I believe they can go from visible to invisible, though I believe that they can probably travel from this realm to the heavenly realm, it's still a truth that they walk among us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 says, Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Think about that. Some have entertained angels without realizing it. I remember one time, this is back when I lived in Long Beach, California. My wife and I had a, a small apartment there. And one night she sent me to the market for something. It was really late. I don't remember exactly what it was for. But I go, as husbands do, and I went to go pick up whatever it was that she wanted. And as I'm leaving the store, I saw this man sitting in front of the, the door. He was dressed in, you know, obviously clothes that looked like they were dirty and hadn't been washed for a while. He was wandering the streets, it had appeared to me. And the man asked me if I could spare any money to feed him. Now, I'm not saying this to brag on the good deed that I did. I don't believe in that. I believe in doing your deeds uh, quietly unless the Lord leads you otherwise. So I said, actually, why don't you come inside and we'll get you whatever you want. So I took this gentleman in with me and he and I went shopping. We went down different aisles and I just stocked him up on groceries. We picked items that wouldn't go bad out there on the streets. So he has a lot of bags and he's really got nowhere to go, but I figured at least, you know, stock him up with something and he could probably figure out what to do with that. So I get in my car. He's in my line of sight the whole time. I was parked right in front of the store. I get in my car. He's waving goodbye. He goes around the building. I wave back to him. And as I'm turning to go down the street, I look around the corner of the building and there's nobody there. The man was gone. There was no bus that had come by. There was no car that picked him up. He probably didn't run with all of those groceries in his hands. I'm not saying that it was absolute, with absolute certainty that I saw an angelic being. I truly believe at that moment, I believe I encountered an angelic being. And this is what he's saying. Let's read it again. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without even realizing it. The next truth about angels is the fact that angels are messengers. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 14 say, Well, Zechariah was in the sanctuary. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. 
and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Next, we see that angels protect Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. Psalm chapter 91, verses 11 through 13 say, For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. Angels warn. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 7 say, And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted, give glory to him. For the time has come when he will sit as judge, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. There we saw an angel giving a warning about the judgment of God. Angels guide, Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. See, I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. And finally, angels serve. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 says, Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. So, I want to pray with you now. Let's just pray that God would open your eyes that you might be more aware of the supernatural realm around you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift your servant to you, and I pray today that you would open their eyes. Cause them to rejoice in the reality of the supernatural. Cause them to stand in wonder of all that you have created. Lord, we thank you for the angelic beings that you've sent to us. We thank you for your love and for your compassion and for your mercy. We thank you for all of the blessings in this world and in the other. We honor you today, Jesus. Help us to honor you with our lives every day. In your name we pray, and I want you to say it because you believe it. Say amen. Well, that is it for the lesson. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you'd like information on how you can join the Spirit family, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. Join the Spirit family today. It's absolutely free. And now I want to get to your comments. These comments are from last week's teaching, The Spirit Speaks Prophets. Of course, The Spirit Speaks was a three-part series, and Prophets is what I talked about in closing that series I recommend that you go and watch that teaching, especially if you're believing for God to speak to you. Of course, we know that the Word of God is the primary word, way that He speaks to us, but He also speaks through other means. And so this message will cause you to appreciate prophets, and it will cause you to be aligned that you might receive prophetic words from prophetic people. We must embrace the gifts that God has given to us, and prophetic people are gifts to the church. So go ahead and check that teaching out. While you're at it, be sure to subscribe, especially if you're watching on YouTube, youtube.com slash Encounter TV. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell when you do so that all of our content can come your way. And finally, if you'd like me to potentially read your comment on next week's edition of Spirit Church, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section right now. Here are the comments from the Spirit Speaks Prophets. Aboli writes, Hello, David. Your teachings are always very uplifting. I have never felt so edified before. Your anointing is felt even on screen. Your teachings are brief, straight to the point, and very sincere. The topic of the prophetic has never been so clear to me. All my doubts have been clarified. You are an incredible teacher. Thank you. Well, I want to make it clear that all the glory belongs to Jesus. Angelina writes, Diga, I thank God for allowing me to discover your wonderful and blessed channel. The Holy Spirit has taught me so much through your channel, and I'm grateful. I thank you and Stephen for all you do. I feel so much more closer to the Lord. God bless you, brother. I look forward to every new video every week. Well, God bless you, Angelina. I'm so thrilled to know that the Lord is touching your life through His ministry. Lady C. Oak writes, Pastor David, thank you so much for this balanced teaching on the office of the prophetic. Being in that office of ministry, I truly appreciate this teaching you gave to us. So blessed today. 
Marita Bo writes, Thanks, my friends, David and Stephen, for the wonderfully anointed worship and spirit-filled teaching. You share high-quality videos, both in content and technically. I like how you trust God with the economy. We really appreciate it and support it with joy. I recommend everyone to support this ministry. God bless you. Looking forward to meeting you on Zoom. Well, Marita is talking about the monthly Zoom calls that Steve and I are now doing with all of our ministry partners. If you haven't partnered yet, be sure that you do. And if you are partnered and didn't see that email, make sure you're looking at your email inbox because we send an invite every single month now. Actually, we did one last month, and now this is going to be the second one. So we are going to be sending these invites every single month, but we have sent the invite for the first one. Make sure you're a part of that. That's something that we really enjoy doing. It's more of a personal touch for our partners. You know, when I'm on camera here, I'm talking to you one way, and you're commenting back to the comments. When I'm live streaming, I'm talking to you one way, and you're talking back to the comments. But on Zoom, I can see your face, you can see my face. You can hear my voice, I can hear your voice, and it's a much more personal dynamic. I love it. And again, that's open to all of our monthly partners. If you haven't partnered with the ministry yet, it's time to do so. I got a verse I want to read to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, in the King James Version, says this, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I love what he said. Necessity is laid on me. Do you realize necessity is laid on us to preach the gospel? You and I are participating in a spiritual war. Now, I recognize that we have victory in Christ. He's won. But that doesn't mean that there still isn't work to do. There are souls that need to be saved. And you and I are, in, are engaged in a war for souls. We're, we're engaged in a battle for the soul of a generation. The enemy is fighting for the eyes and the ears of this generation. This generation is consuming pornography. This generation is consuming uh, movies filled with filth and music filled with filth. And this generation is a part of a system that's taking it to hell. Now, it doesn't matter if someone's been programmed by the system through movies and music and through all sorts of the education system even. Because even if they were watching all of that, even if they were receiving that darkness for decades, one moment with God can change everything. One touch of the Holy Spirit's power can transform that heart, can change that life. And so you and I are fighting back against the darkness. You and I are shining a light in the dark place. In the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of all that deception, you and I are placing the uncompromised truth in front of the unbeliever. And I want you to join us in this. Join God's army as we all unite together in the thousands, we have thousands of ministry partners all around the world, join together with us. Let's join our resources, join our efforts, and let's go and win souls. Do that today. Become a partner today for just $10 a month or more. If you want information on how you can become a monthly ministry supporter, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. If you'd like to give a one-time gift, you can go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. But I encourage you to do that today. Join this army of believers and help us fight for the soul of this generation. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.